Good morning, everyone. My name is Shana Rosen, and I'm the Communication Director at 40. I'm happy to be here today with our CEO, James Archer, and Communication Strategist, Rebecca Cancino, for a little chat about designing compelling customer experiences. 40 works with clients all over the country and the world to help them design memorable experiences that help inspire their customers, motivate their staff, and increase their revenue. And we found that there's millions of companies out there that have really grown from the ground up into successful businesses. They have customers that love them, people who love working there, and they're making tons of money. So over the years, we've studied these companies to really figure out what's that common thread and how did they do it? We found that a lot of them had founders and staff that really just worked their butts off, and a lot of them perfected their business over the years, trying different things and seeing what works. And then others were just plain lucky. But as we started to look deeper, we realized there was a common thread and that the true secret to all of their success was that they all had roots. And these roots were the foundation of their brand, and it set the stage for being consistent and compelling in all of their branding, their marketing, and creating this overall really memorable customer experience. So today, James and Rebecca are going to walk you through how to reveal your own roots with six important questions. And this will be more of a casual conversation, so if you have questions at any point, feel free to type them in the chat box, and we'll try to answer a few um, as we go along, and then a few at the end as well. So with that, I'll hand the mic over to James and Rebecca so we can get started. So I want to start with a little bit of story. There's a, um, there's a company that I'm a fan of called DBR Construction, so I want to tell you a little bit more about them. Um, they were founded in 1990. And they kind of, it was these three guys who kind of wanted to take a different approach to construction. They wanted to treat it a little more like a service business rather than a traditional sort of, you know, manufacturing type business, which is very commodity driven. It's not really customer service focused. You just sort of do the work and move on. Um, and not long after they started, they kind of sat down to really figure out what their company is all about and what makes them tick and what makes them different from other construction companies. And they kind of came up with this, this driving purpose behind what they do which is that DPR exists to build great things. That was sort of their, their internal slogan that they, they decided to live by. Um, and you know, when you, when you have a, a core purpose like that, it makes things kind of, you know, it, it can be difficult sometimes to make decisions because you, know, you have to measure everything you do against that. Um, you know, if you have a, you know, if you're working on a project and some, some new piece of work comes in and it's kind of a, you know, it's a strip mall or something, and you're you're really feeling the need to take on some extra projects, but it's not a great thing. You have to sort of measure it against your purpose and say, do we build strip malls or do we build great things? And so they sort of stuck to their guns over the years. And while it you know it took them a while to get ramped up, and they had all kinds of crazy situations in the middle of it, you know, eventually they started you know building new offices for companies like Apple and Pixar and Facebook because they came to them specifically to build great things. And so by sticking to their guns and sticking to that core purpose even when sometimes it didn't seem to make sense on the surface, they were able to build a really strong reputation around it. Um, and so as a, as a result of that sort of crystal clear sense of purpose that they had, uh, within 10 years, they reached more than a billion dollars in revenue. That's not a million, that's a billion dollars in revenue. Um, they're, they're consistently ranked among the top general contractors in the nation, and they're also voted one of the best companies to work for. And more than 90% of their business comes from repeat customers. So the way that they did that was through their, they essentially had developed those roots. You know, from that core sense of purpose, their whole culture had, had developed around that. And they, they came up with their core values and all these other things that tied it together and really helped reinforce who they are as a, as a company. So the thing about roots is when you, when you have those, it's, it's just like a tree. You know, when a tree has deep roots and a storm comes along, you know, it's not going to fall over. It's not going to just snap. It stays put, and it's able to weather those difficult situations because there's something of substance holding it in place. Um, and companies work just the same way. You know, another thing about roots is, you know, a, a tree that has deep roots is able to get more nourishment from sort of the soil around it, and a company that has deep roots can pull more out of the world around it. And it, it can get more out of its employees. It can get more out of its clients and partners, and just more good things happen to it. And this is not just touchy-feely stuff either. It's actually documented. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have re read the book Built to Last by uh, Jim Collins and Jerry Porras. And they studied what they called them visionary companies. But they're companies that have sort of a strong sense of purpose, 
core values and so on, and they actually measured the effect of this over the course of decades and found that there is a radical difference in performance between companies that have this, this strong sense of purpose, these deep roots, and just the rest of the market. So it's, it's a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is sort of on the emotional side or on the touchy-feely side, but this is real stuff. This is how human beings work, and it actually makes a big difference in the bottom line. Yeah, and, and you know what's interesting about that is it's so easy not to be a visionary company. It's so easy to fall into that average group of companies because business owners tend to get wrapped up in things like numbers, quality performance, cash flow, balance sheets, all of those things, right? But if you think about it, your customers are human beings. They're not numbers, and they really crave human experiences, right, which they can get from a brand. So there's a really big reason for this, this shift in how people select the products and services that they want to use. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, kind of basic psychology 101. Most of us learned it in business school if you went, but it's just kind of showing how our needs change and become more complex as our basic needs are being met, right? So in modern America, a lot of consumers, not not all, but most of us, have a pretty high standard of living um, where the bottom two tiers are already met. Right, so we're not pursuing basic features anymore, even when we think that we are. We're really pursuing something that's um, part of the higher tiers, those higher needs, and we call those affiliation, aspiration, and identity, right? Those top three tiers. And all of these needs aren't met enough through um, you know, products and services. What's happening is, is you'll see that really, customers are looking for that kind of experience that you're providing beyond just the product or service. So you'll see that smart companies understand this and they're kind of moving away from talking just about features and benefits and really focusing on the overall experience that they're providing to their customers. Right. So if you think about it, think about someone who's buying like a, a Harley Davidson bike right? They're not buying it because of the leather and the rivets. That might be a part of it, but there's really something deeper than that. There's this deeper sense of, you know, resenting conformity. They want to feel independent, like they're in control of their own destiny. Maybe they hate that they sit in a cubicle from nine to five every day. That Harley Davidson bike is much more than a pair of wheels and, um, and an engine. It, it represents freedom. It represents something much deeper for them. So from a numbers perspective, Harley Davidson isn't just a machine, right? It's an experience that people can use to really transcend something that they're experiencing in their everyday lives. The same thing happens when you're going to Disney World. Um, if you think about what Disney World really is when you go, it's just a bunch of overpriced you know, treats and rides and you're waiting in lines, right? So why do we go? We go for this experience, this feeling of being transported um, to somewhere else. So the product itself is just an excuse to get involved, but the brand is what you're using to really provide people with that magical experience that taps into their values. And what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of go through six questions that are going to reveal your company's roots so that you will have the appropriate foundation, a solid foundation, to kind of build that experience on top of. So these questions are... are as simple as they sound, this is a set of things that we've developed over the course of essentially the last decade as we've been working with clients and helping them develop their their brands, their identities, their company cultures. And as, as deceptively simple as it is, this is a really powerful tool for sorting out what's going on inside your company and sort of defining a framework for figuring out what those elements are and how to communicate those to people. So the first question is simply, why are you in this business? What is your purpose? And it, it's typically not just to make money. A lot, of, a lot of people who get into business think that they're doing it to make money or they think that maybe they're doing it just for uh, freedom and they don't like answering to a boss. Usually those, those two reasons are contributing factors, but they're not defining reasons. Most people don't get into business specifically for either of those purposes is because there's some other way that they want to make their mark on the world. Um, and, you know, a lot of times that then becomes part of the company culture and those founders attract people who have similar goals and ideals and kind of get swept up in that company culture. And at some point it really takes over and becomes part of the company, not just something that's in the, the founder's head or the CEO's head. 
Now, when the reality of running a business sets in over the years, um, you know, for example, those of you who went through the, uh, the, the, the recession in 2008 and were particularly affected by that, uh, it's, it's really easy to diverge from that sense of purpose. And you start thinking about, oh, should I compromise on this? Should I, should I cave and do that thing that we didn't typically do before, but we kind of just need the money right now? And there are situations where that's valid, but you also have to be careful that those temptations don't just knock the company totally off course. There are a lot of companies that over the years sort of just get away from what, what even got them interested in, in their business in the first place. I've talked to people who've been in business for 10 years, and by the time they get to us, they don't even remember why they're in that business anymore. They forget what why they were excited about it, and that lack of passion starts to come through. And a lot of what we have to do is get them back to that original sense of why they why they love this job, why they love their industry, why they love their clients, and then figure out how to communicate that. And ultimately what this does is it focuses the company. You know, when you have a strong sense of purpose, the people who don't believe in that or believe in something contrary to that tend to drift away from the company. And those who are attracted to that want to join that company. And what you wind up with is a pretty powerful team of people who are, are moving in the same direction. And it, you know, it also helps get everyone aligned behind deciding what they're doing. A lot of times it'll help define decision making so that you don't have constant debates about whether you should do this, that, or the other thing. That clear sense of purpose will help tell you what you need to do. And so it actually, you're able to make decisions much faster and kind of move things down the road a lot more quickly. An example of this is a client that we had called Volta. There is a local security company here in Arizona. And they were, by the time they met with us, they had, I don't know, five or six different um, brands going on. They had various, you know, branches of their company doing different things. And they were really struggling to figure out how to tie them all together. They were all under different names and different logos. And when they drove a truck out to a location, it was really hard for them because they couldn't, you know, the, the customers were confused about who it was and why the truck had a different logo than the other thing. So we were figuring out how to tie it all together. And a lot, when, when we spent a lot of time interviewing with them, what we found out was that there was this real sense of wanting to make something better than was, was previously there. And they, we worked with them and developed this sense of purpose of inventing better options. And that's kind of the phrase that they, they started rallying around. And then we carried that throughout their brand and figured out how can we make this brand all about inventing better options. And beyond that, we actually worked with them to tie that into their company culture and figure out how to train their staff on this, how to, how to get them thinking that way so that when they're confronted with a problem, they don't just go to the knee-jerk response. They actually try and think through it and come up with new ways of doing things, new options that didn't exist before. And then they can carry those benefits to their customers. You know, some other companies that are pretty well known that have strong sense of purpose. Um, you're probably familiar with a lot of these. And we, you know, we put our own on there about championing humanity. And that's, that's been a, a really core driving purpose for us that has helped clarify a lot of things. When we're confronted with a situation, we're able to look at it and say, is, is this championing humanity or is it not? And if it's not, we then don't do it. And it, it actually makes our decision making a lot easier and it makes it easier for us to get through difficult decisions. And it's so much part of our culture that everyone on the team knows it, everyone on the team is thinking it, and it becomes very hard to diverge from that path, which like I was saying before, kind of keeps us focused and keeps us moving forward. So the next question is, what's important to you? And these are your values. What are the concepts that really drive the company? Uh, the a, a value is essentially what is important to the people in your company. And it's not something that you can make up. Um, it'll typically be an abstract concept. Uh, but it won't, you know, a lot of times if you if you just try and jot down a list, it'll you'll come up with the wrong things. You'll kind of come up with the stereotypical answers of quality and integrity and and concepts like that. But it, it really what you have to do is analyze your company and figure out what are the real values that are going on? What do your employees really value? And those are the things that are going to make your decision making in your company a lot easier. Um, avoid the generic feel good words. We call them the, the defaults. And you know, usually when a, when a company comes to us and, and we start talking about values, they say, oh yeah, we, we had a 
you know, we had a company workshop a while ago and we figured out what, what those values are. And then they list exactly the ones we think they're going to list of quality, integrity, and service, and, and the usual stuff that you guys hear all the time. And nobody's interested in those. Those don't really inspire anyone. They don't inspire your staff. They don't inspire you. It's the same things you hear everywhere else on, on plaques, on walls, and big corporate offices. So you have to figure out what's really important to your company. And a lot of times those are the quirky, unusual things that really define your company's character. And if purpose is kind of like the engine of your company that, that moves it forward, then your values are the steering wheel that help move the direction that you take. Um, and if you, just like a car, you need both the engine and the steering wheel to actually have a, a functioning vehicle. So an example of this was uh, one of our clients called Pure Rain. And we worked with them to sort of identify what their, their set of values are. They had a, a, an interesting technology where it's a, a watering tool that you might use in your backyard or in your garden, but it oxygenates the water and it actually helps the plants to grow about 30% more than, than typical water does. And so we talked with them and they, they, you know, they had a lot of passion behind what they were doing. And there's a reason they, they got into this particular business and wanted to see this succeed. And so as we talked to them about their values, we started to, to make some connections and try and figure out how we can best represent that. And we actually came up with a, a metaphor that tied it together with NASA. And so even though you, you wouldn't necessarily notice it on the surface, if you if you look at Pure Rain's packaging and website and so on, you'll sort of see the influence of this metaphor throughout that in a, in a subconscious way ties it back to those values and really communicates those values to everyone inside their organization and to their customers. So, the next phase that you're going to really want to go through and start asking some questions about are kind of looking at what makes your company um, different and how do you fit into the market. So you're really going to be talking about your positioning there, right? So it's really easy to have the tendency to kind of look like everyone else and try to do the same thing that other companies are doing to reach customers, right? But have you ever noticed how when you're looking at banks and you're trying to select a bank, all of the banks kind of are saying the same thing. Sometimes they even use the same types of colors and the same shiny surface and it can be harder to distinguish what makes one bank really different from the next, right? So while it's really tempting to kind of look at your industry and see what other people are doing and, and imitate that. Um, it just makes you look like everyone else, right? So you end up becoming um, just a commodity. So branding is not about trying to look like everyone else. It's really about trying to figure out who exactly you're talking to and then really focusing on what makes you different. It's about claiming what's yours, not really fitting in. So there's some companies that have really done uh, a great job at this. And it's something that's a really simple thing that we all see every day, and that's cereal, breakfast cereal. It's as ordinary as ordinary gets, right? But here's a good example of two products that have done such a good job at really having laser focus on who exactly they're talking to, right? So Wheaties, they're talking to people who are into sports, eating healthy. Um, they've really focused in on that target audience, and then with uh, Special K, you know, they're talking to women. It's all about making sure, you know, you're eating the right amount of calories every day. And really, if you look at the nutritional value of these two cereals, they're quite similar. You could probably have a bowl of Wheaties that would have the same, you know, amount of calories as a bowl of Special K. But the difference here is that they figured out who they want to talk to and they've tailored everything um, to those audiences, right? So it's Obviously, they've done some work here to think about who their best customer is. They've really gotten inside their heads and they've researched them and they're figuring out how to communicate with this specific audience. And it's really tempting um, to kind of not to do that, right? To just say what other people are saying. It seems easier. It seems safer. But the downside of doing what everyone else is doing is that you're not going to get um, different results, right? You're never going to be a leader if you're operating in that space. So when it comes to positioning, just like with Wheaties and, and Special K, they're talking to very specific types of audiences. 
um, it's important for you to think about what type of audience you're really going to focus on. What are the customers that you're going to talk to? Um, and it's okay if you decide to focus on one group of customers to miss out on the others. You don't have to appeal to everyone because the truth is when you try to appeal to everyone, you end up just kind of meh, you know, really not appealing to anyone at all. There's no strong connection there, right? So. People are going to be more likely to pay attention to you. The right types of customers are going to be attracted to your business when you speak directly to them and you really have that laser focused positioning. One example um, of some positioning that we've worked on here is for a local bank, uh, Gateway Bank. They're here uh, in Arizona in a small town just outside of Phoenix um, called Mesa. And they really are such a different type of bank. Besides being a local kind of neighborhood bank, when you walk into the doors of this bank, people are extremely friendly. They love working there. It shows on their faces. The entire setup of the bank is different. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with going into the bank to talk to a teller and you're kind of standing between the teller and a pane of glass a really thick plexiglass nowadays. Gateway Bank is not at all like that. When you go to sit down with a teller, it's almost like you're sitting down in a living room style area. It's so comfortable and inviting and warm. And they really wanted um, to talk to people who cared about those types of things. So when we were looking at their positioning, right, it would have been very easy for them to look like a big bank and, and tout all the features and benefits they have and show how they're just as convenient and easy to use as everyone else, right? Um, because they are convenient and they do have those services too. But what they realized is that what makes them special and the types of customers that really respond well um, to Gateway Bank and that really flourish as a customer there are people who care about the same things that they do. So that ties back to the values, as James was saying, that really drive everything you're going to do. So Gateway Bank really cares about community. They really care about helping local businesses succeed and thrive and making sure that everyone feels like family and they're really taking care of those kind of old-fashioned values. So that's what they decided to really position themselves as and talk to people who also care about those things so that those customers could identify that, hey, we actually have those common values. We share um, those values and really make a connection there because that's the way that you're going to make customers who actually become um, you know real advocates for your business it goes far beyond just a transaction so obviously in order to kind of build on this positioning once you kind of decide who you're talking to you need to really decide how you're going to talk to them right so a really important part of deciding how you're going to talk to people is to get into the minds of your customers. Obviously, the first thing you can do is just ask people. Ask them what they like about your company, what they don't like, how they chose you over your competitors. Really do the work and the due diligence to get inside their heads and figure out how they're making decisions, right? Um, are people that you're working with, are your customers, are they more logical, are they emotional? Um, do they make decisions quickly or slowly? All of these types of things are things that you need to be considering um, because it's going to shape the entire experience that you create for them, right? So doing this work and gathering this information and really studying your customer, studying your audience, um, will allow you to kind of see the experience you're providing through their eyes instead of your own. And it's going to really help you not fall into the trap of making decisions based off of your personal opinions, your own preferences, or just trends that are going on in the market. Again, kind of grounding you and creating this cohesive experience that comes out of really understanding your audience and who you are. So some of the things that we like to do here at 40 to really help our customers and our clients study their customers is we research them and we compile this research into personas, right? So what we'll do when we're going through to research and really figure out who this company is talking to is we'll interview their internal staff, we'll interview their customers and really help draw this complete mental picture, right, of who this audience is. And we use this as a filter to inform the rest of our work. So this is not just demographic data, um, you know, how old someone is, what side of town they're living on, right? Because those types of numbers really don't tell you who someone is. Um, it doesn't tell you why they make the decisions that they do. So to really tap into th their psyche and how these people are making decisions um, and fulfill their deeper, deeper needs, you're going to need to really start thinking about 
um, all of those things we just mentioned earlier, how they're making decisions. Think about what type of jobs they have, what they do every day. Um, if you're providing, you know, like, like we were just talking about with the bank service, think about what they might be doing before they come in to your bank, what they might be doing after, other things that they have going on alongside that. And an exercise that I have that I really like to do to kind of help provide the basis of uh, creating that persona is just kind of outlined in this Venn diagram right here. So I like to go through what people are feeling, doing, and how they learn to make sure that all of the experiences that I'm providing align to that. So it's a really easy exercise that you can do yourself. I, I just take down, you know, in, in its most basic form, you can just take down a piece of paper and go through this thing. So once you've kind of decided who your audience is, and typically it's not going to be just one type of person, right? Like you're, you're going to have different types of people within that targeted um, audience segment. So what you can do is for each one of those audience segments that you've identified, you can go through and just start jotting down things like how are they feeling, right? What are their stress levels when they're interacting with your business or your product or service? What are their wants? What are their needs? Are they happy? Are they... Um, going to be really busy? Do they have a lot of stuff going on? Think about uh, their learning abilities. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to um, people who have a really high level of education? Are you talking to all sorts of people who come from different walks of life? Maybe making considerations for people who are speaking English as a second language. Some of those types of things can really help. And then finally, um, you really want to think about what they're going to be doing. So what are their physical surroundings? Um, and that can really help you. We, we went ahead and put together um, a kind of a kiosk experience for one of our clients. And this became so important because if you think about where a kiosk is and the customer experience that you're providing for that person, typically kiosks are located in the front of a store, right? So if you think about what is, what is the experience for someone who's coming into a kiosk in the front of a store, and that just kind of gives you an example of the type of detail that you want to be jotting down as you're going through um, and thinking about your users' learning capabilities, their feelings, and what they're doing at the time. So an example of something we did to really tap into a specific segment of an audience was for Epiphany Chocolates. Now, Epiphany Chocolates, actually, their audience base is typically women most of the time. And we've structured most of the experience to speak directly to women as this luxurious, kind of fun, um, delightful way of, of getting chocolates and, and treating themselves to something nice and making it fun. However, um, a segment of this audience around certain holidays, like Valentine's Day, um, is men, because men are looking to appeal to women and get them gifts that they like. And you know, chocolates are a traditional Valentine's Day treat. So we really went through and looked at the audience of, of who are these men around Valentine's Day? What are they thinking? Are they stressed out? If you see that headline there that says, don't screw up Valentine's Day, that's really tapping into what most guys are thinking. They just want to make their girl happy. They don't want her to end up crying and pouting and sad at the end of the day. They just want to stay out of trouble, basically. So we're really getting into their heads and thinking, you know, what what are they thinking about as they're going through and trying to select the perfect gift for that girl in their life and structuring the entire experience um, and making it unique to them. So through doing that groundwork and studying this segment of the audience, we actually ended up creating this special microsite um, that had quite a different look and feel and even wording um, than the traditional or than the general epiphany site um, because we wanted this to really appeal specifically to that audience. Another part of kind of building um, how you're going to be communicating with your audience and fleshing out your roots is taking it a step further and saying, okay, great. Now that we know exactly who we're talking to and we know how we're going to communicate with them and what their needs are. Um, how are we going to look, sound, and feel, and make sure that that experience is really consistent, right? So if you think about people, next time you go into a store and you know you, you look around, you see people, they're dressed all different ways, right? Just look at what people are wearing. They have different types of, of hairstyles, different types of car, different types of um, accessories, and they're trying to tell you or the world something about who they are as a person, right? So when you're thinking about that, it's you 
more importantly, want to think about, you know, why are they wearing that and what exactly are they trying to tell you? People have this habit um, of trying to imitate rather than innovate and come up with something fresh. So when you're thinking about, you know, crafting your business's style, um, it's really easy to kind of look around and, again, just kind of copy and imitate what your competitor competition is doing um, because it's psychologically proven that our brains kind of shy away from those fresh ideas. Why? Um, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have that uncertainty. And our brains try and help us reduce that discomfort um, by kind of, biasing us against these new ideas, right? So as you're going through and really thinking about how your company is going to express its style, um, it's important to be aware of this natural bias that you have so that you can actually put yourself in a position to create fresh ideas, right? Um, just be aware of that. Designers deal with this um, all the time, and they've actually trained their minds to get around that natural bias so that they can create those fresh ideas. And when a client comes back or when someone on your team comes back and says, you know, this isn't what we want to do, and they're kind of maybe putting some pressure to do something that's really conforming to what everyone else is doing, you can have that conversation and encourage them to be aware of that bias as well so that you can really have the space to create something fresh. So really getting into the nuts and bolts of how you want to build the style around your brand. Oftentimes we find that your style is best represented um, in just simple descriptive words and phase, or phrases. Excuse me. So. These words like joyful, crisp, delightful, uh, bold, traditional, right? These types of words really provide the foundation um, that you're going to use to build all the, exper um, the experience around your brand. So whether it's visual design, whether it's verbal design, whether it, through your copy, um, these types of style words that you center on are really going to ground the rest of your work. Some of the things that we can you can do to make this easier is I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the game apples to apples but they have this big deck of descriptive words um, like cold, nasty, dull, courageous, nerdy, glamorous, all of these different descriptive words if you kind of need something to get your creative juices flowing and these types of uh, card decks can be really helpful for kind of guiding you through this process. We actually use them with some of our client meetings when we're brainstorming with clients. So if you get stuck, um, try try grabbing a, a card deck of apples to apples or even just reach for um, a dictionary and go through and kind of pull some descriptive words out to help you pinpoint exactly what that style is going to be. Sorry guys, my slides got stuck a little bit there. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how creating a consistent and specific type of style really helped us um, provide a really rich and unique experience, branding experience for one of our clients, Jacob Bromwell. They sell just regular commodities, right? This is camping equipment. And when they came to us, their website was very generic and just centered on kind of really toting the benefits of their products. And they're great products that are built with quality and care. However, when we came to really looking at exactly how we wanted to craft a style that fit who they were, of course, you, we had already done that, um, built that foundation of getting into their audience, finding out what really makes them tick. But then we looked at really creating a style that suited and kind of aligned with their values. And we were able to build out this rich, beautiful experience that tapped into kind of the traditional things that we all love about the products and services that they're selling. So it went far beyond just a place to go and buy, you know, a simple piece of equipment for camping, but a place to experience the traditions that you love and the memories that are built when you're actually using their products. And that was weaved into every touch point of the experience. So the final question that we look at when we're trying to develop a brand is, is when you reach your goals, what does that look like? And really try and create a, a rich sense of vision around the, the brand itself. Um, you know, it's really, a, it's not just about setting tangible goals. Uh, you know, a lot of companies will set their vision as we want this much revenue by this year and we want to grow to this many employees and we want to take over this market. And, and those are great, but really what you need to do is figure out how to, how to paint a picture of 
what that future looks like and then how you can you know let your staff know about that and what that does when they have that shared vision is it gets everyone kind of moving the same direction rowing together and you get there a lot more quickly when everyone knows where they're going um, it gets them excited about the future it boosts morale and it, it does a lot to kind of move the company overall forward and you know your customers can also be a part of that so wh that's why we need to sort of identify and define that information even if most of what we're doing on our side is externally facing is so that we can help their customers be you know catch that vision and get excited about it and you know there really is you know if you think about the companies that you love most of them will have some sort of even even if it's not well defined or explicitly defined there's some vision of what the future could look like that you get when you interact with that brand um, you know if you think about Nike for example you know they're envisioning a future of where where people have higher performance and mental discipline and some of these things and you know people who see themselves and want that to be part of their future want to engage with that brand and, and interact with them and make that part of their future as well so these are the six questions that you know we've sort of found over the years have become a really powerful framework for developing brands and you know there's a there's a, a lot that we do with each one of those we have exercises and activities we have things that we've learned over the years we have patterns and trends that we've identified but really even uh, anyone any business owner can start going through this list and start hashing through this stuff for themselves and figure out a lot of great information that will help move them forward and help better define their company and what they're doing so the next obvious question is why does this stuff all matter you know we've talked about you know what what we think you should do but the reason to actually do it um, you know the number one reason is it, it inspires your customers and that's something that is really hard to put it put a dollar sign on but it it can have a tremendous effect you know this is one of those things that seems like a touchy-feely thing and I've talked with a lot of business owners who who genuinely feel that they're in a commodity business and and they have a product and some people want the product and they just buy the product but the truth is, even the most commoditized business, even a, a you know B two B organization or a government contractor, could do really well to create an experience that inspires their customers, inspires the people who work with them, because it makes them think of that that option in the future. It makes them sort of rationalize why they want to work with this company, even if that company is a little bit cheaper. And it does a lot to really solidify the finances and of your organization and how you make sales it also energizes your staff which can have a, a tremendous effect also um, you know when you have your company culture sort of aligned around these things your staff gets excited about it and they are they are happy to come to work each day they're happy to move that work forward and that comes across when they're interacting with customers as well it comes out in the quality of their work it comes out in the uh, way that they treat the people who come into your place, your place of business, um, it, you know, in a variety of ways, it really is a, a potent source of success for your company when when your staff is aligned and rallying behind it. And you know, ultimately, it it boosts your revenue. All these things tie together, and and we wouldn't be doing this stuff just for fun. Um, the reason that we're in business and the reason that people come to us is we're able to increase companies' revenue by going through these steps, and we've seen that happen uh, multiple times. Um, you know, it. Uh, I was talking with the the guys from Jacob Bromwell recently, and they were talking about how within the course of two years, their revenue had multiplied significantly. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a a small percentage increase. It it was multiples of their original revenue when they first came to us. And this is a company that's been around since 1819. So they they've been on this earth a good long time and this is the, probably the biggest revenue spike that they've had over that entire course of of their history and it is it is due primarily to the experience that we were able to create around them and getting their brand aligned and helping them catch that vision and move it forward. So just to let you guys know, we're hoping to have webinars like this as kind of an ongoing series. Um, our next one will be in January of uh, next year. And uh, you know, if you have any additional questions in the long term, you're certainly welcome to email us. You can reach out on Twitter or Facebook, um, and we'll almost always respond. You know, sometimes we get a little bogged down and we don't catch everything, but we are uh, very good at responding. So even if you have a trivial question, try asking it, and you'll probably get a, a good response for us. Um, 
So with that, that's all we have for today, but we would love to answer some questions for you guys. Um, and I'll kind of turn it over to Shana, who's watching the chat, and she can uh, let us know what you guys are thinking, and uh, we're happy to address anything that comes up. Thanks, James. Well, um, as we're waiting for a couple questions to come in, um, I got one over email, uh, and it was somebody asking, you know, this all sounds great, but, like, does it really make money? And, and if so, like, how long does it see to take the results, or to see the results? Excuse me. That is a, a really good question. The... Um, you know, as I was kind of mentioning with, with Jacob Bromwell, they're a good tangible example of, of the effect that that can have. We've had, you know, anecdotal reports from other clients as well of, of seeing significant increases due to the, the work that we've done or the work that e even other companies that they've done themselves, they've seen a lot of results from it. Um, it is hard to measure, though. You know, this kind of work, you know, what we do is something that will influence maybe someone who's not a customer. Someone comes to the website, they get a positive impression, they go home, they refer it to their neighbor, their neighbor remembers that and tells their cousin about it six months later at the family reunion, and then that cousin goes in and actually purchases the product. It's really hard to measure and track that, and it's hard to tie it to a specific instance. We live kind of in a world where business owners are really rabid about wanting detailed metrics and detailed you know, quantifications of what's happening in their business. They want to run an ad campaign, and within a couple of weeks and measure it and, and consider that proof of whether it worked or not. And we tend to view that as a, a fairly short-sighted way to do it. You know, we think that metrics are tremendously important if you have the right metrics, but what most people are considering business metrics and ROI are a lot of times a really short-sighted view. So when you're doing branding work, branding is a long-term play. It is something that, you know, our, our company is seeing the benefits of things that we did three, four, five years ago, and people who remember the things that we did back then are becoming customers for us now. And the things that we're doing now are going to pay off years from now, but we have to keep making that investment so that that pays off. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that too, because you know, don't think that metrics are bad. There's there's good types of metrics too. We actually use a lot of metrics as insight to figure out kind of how we can do things better, or how we can help our clients do things better. So I'm not sure what level um, you're at. In, in branding and marketing, but if you're using insights, digital insights to kind of track and see how customers are experiencing things online um, or just measuring performance, that can be really helpful um, when you're trying to gauge, you know, if a certain way of communicating is working or not, or if you need to adjust a few things. All right, we have another question here from the chat, um, and this person is wondering, how do we find uh, customers or companies that really care and value the type of research that we do, as opposed to going with some of those standard and, and trendy solutions? So how do you identify companies like that or, or get them to see the value in this type of work? So I'm assuming this comes from someone who does similar work, maybe there's a designer or marketing person, something like that. Um, I think the way that we go about it is really sort of practicing what we preach. I mean, we tend to be fairly distinctive in what we do, and we're not afraid to say what we do. We don't try and be a full-service agency. We don't claim to do whatever the latest buzzword is. Um, you know, while most marketing agencies are talking about metrics and proof and social media and stuff like that, those are most of the things we're actually not talking about. We take those things into consideration, but that's not our angle on things, and we're not embarrassed to be out in this other area of the space and what that means is when people see something that that sticks out and is sort of distinctive if they're the sort of person who's inclined to appreciate that they'll they'll drift toward that yeah and i can actually add a little bit to that um as you go through and meet people that you're thinking about working with a lot of times as you're going through either that sales or relationship meeting process you'll tend to see if this is the type of person that does fit that type of customer that you're looking to work with and uh, a lot of times we're tempted to work with companies that may not be the best fit for us and not saying we as 40 but anyone um, because you know either you need to make ends meet or um, you just need some work to fill in the gaps but um, we've really found that working with companies that have those same values and vision that we have and that are a good fit for us ends up working a lot better in the long run. So um, even if you're thinking maybe I should make some compromises, again, sticking to that purpose and values and the type of customer that you really think is ideal for you is usually going to work out better. 
a, a lot of what we're doing also for for business owners is counterintuitive. It goes against what they've been taught. It goes against what they're they're learning in school or reading in magazines. And so there is a lot of coaching and education that goes into this process. That's the reason we're doing webinars like this one is to help get the word out about how these things work, why they're important, and not not everyone gets this stuff. I mean, if you if you talk to a hundred business owners. There's not a lot of them necessarily that are going to be able to tell you the reason that these things are important. So we, we spend a lot of our time focused on education and just sort of getting the word out about this, these concepts. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to even like when we were talking about personas earlier, to the personas that we've created to understand our audience. It's kind of really getting into their mind and figuring out what do our clients care about and how can we frame these conversations about these important things that are really going to help them take their business to the next level in a way that they'll understand and see the value in. So just wanted to add that bit there. All right. The next question comes from um, Brian Sun, who is a, a friend of 40. And he wants to know, um, do you ask all of these questions in one meeting, or is it a process over a few months? You know, What does that look like? I, I would say that if we ask these questions up front in one meeting, most people would not know how to answer them, or they'd, they'd have some partial answers, but it's not necessarily what we need. So we, we have a, a fairly extensive uh, discovery workshop process that we use when we start our uh, relationship with a client. And it's not so much that we ask people to answer those questions directly. A lot of times we'll ask them, but we, we take the answers with a grain of salt. And really what we have to do is extract those answers from them uh, sort of without them knowing it you know we ask a lot of questions and then we go through those the answers that they gave and sort of pull insights out of them mm -hmm. and then assemble a picture of what that looks like mm -hmm. and, and that's an important point that james has made that kind of we we extract those answers he said and, and kind of just a little clarification on what that means is so if you're working in marketing or branding right now and you know you're thinking how do i get these types of clear answers from my customers or from the people I'm working with. Just know that, you know, sometimes when you're asking someone to define their style, it, it's not something that they can just spout off five different adjectives and say, yes, this is what defines my style. It's kind of like really doing the work to frame your questions. Um, so maybe you're not directly asking them that, but you're asking them questions that will help you discover what that style is. So it's making sure that you really think hard um, about the questions that you're writing and making sure that they're actually going to help you extract those nuggets of information that are really important that will allow you to help build this experience for them. Yeah, what we, we've definitely learned over the years that you you can't necessarily take answers to those questions at face value. And we've had we've had clients tell us that they're, innovative when during our conversation it becomes very apparent that that's not that's not really what they value or we've had people tell us that you know they want to be professional and we're sitting in the meeting and having a, a ton of fun with them and they're joking and we're doing all this but they say that, that really they're a professional organization and they just want to be buttoned down and, and so we have to kind of extract that from them we, we look at who they actually are and get to know them and figure out how to communicate what's really going on not the the facade that they think they want to present to the market all right. Last question that we have from the chat um, is about archetypes. Um, brand archetypes is something that we've talked about a lot um, in our work and our blog, so it's probably something that um, they saw there. But uh, they were wanting to know, do we use archetypes when trying to figure out a company's brand, and, and if so, how? So James, if you could maybe give a little bit of background on what archetypes are for those people who don't know first. Sure. So a, a standard part of our process, you know, we talked a little bit, for example, about how we took this, uh, these gardening water, water tools and created this NASA metaphor around them. And that's an, that's an example of, uh, we use a lot of metaphor in the work that we do to help bring out those values and style and, and give people sort of a subconscious understanding of what it is that we're trying to communicate. Uh, a common one of those metaphors is, is archetypes. And these are these are cultural characters that sort of recur in in literature and religion and and throughout cultures in the world and they're they're simp they're sort of universal they're just basic human characters and we've identified a, a a number of them through just through working through the years and what we do is essentially as we go through the discovery workshop and as we learn more about the clients we figure out the answers to these questions that we've talked about we draw parallels with those to some of these archetypes or other metaphors and find ways that we can 
come up with shortcuts to communicate them. So, for example, if you're talking about being being an outlaw and you want to be rebellious and you want to um, you know, overthrow the establishment. Like Harley Davidson. Like Harley Davidson. So their metaphor could be something along the lines of an outlaw or a rebel or a cowboy or a bandit, something like that. And we use those as, as really just as a mnemonic. It helps us remember and it helps us, it gives us also a source of inspiration to draw from visually, verbally, and so on. You know, we try not to be too trite about it. We don't want to be cliche and have it come across like a prom theme where it's, it's very obvious what the metaphor was. We try and keep it fairly low key, but it, it really does provide a rich source of inspiration and it really helps even the client themselves remember who they are and what they're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And I can give you a, a quick example of an archetype that we used recently just to, to show you how it can actually work in uh, real life. Um, Rebecca had mentioned Gateway Bank uh, that we worked with uh, recently. And as we were going through and figuring out that they were really intent on being this real local community traditional bank, but that it was also modern and, and could cater to people's needs um, that they were looking for now, um, one of the archetypes that we used was the traditionalist. So really going back to those old-fashioned, almost mid Western values. So as we started looking at their color palette and their logos and visuals, it wasn't giving off that same warm and personable feeling. And so throughout the process, we realized with the help of that archetype and looking at their roots that it would probably make sense to change their color palette to something more warm. So we ended up going with um, kind of a, a burnt orange, almost like red brick that you would find in, in old buildings to give off that, that warm feeling that people get when they walk into the bank. So that's an example of how we used the archetype of the traditionalist and took that all the way through to the color palette and the logo to communicate that same feeling that they wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that's about all the questions that we have in the chat. If you guys have any other questions or uh, thoughts after this, feel free to send them to us. Uh, we're on Twitter at 40 Agency, F-O-R-T-Y Agency, um, online at 40agency.com, or you can email us at hello at 40agency.com. So that's all for today. Hope you guys enjoyed, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye now.